Good morning. Welcome. Welcome to the 2021 Aging Well speaking, Speaker Series. I'm Heather English and I am one of a five member committee that has put this year's program together for you. And I will also be this year's moderator. For our third and final presentation, we are so excited to welcome Deb Logan to share her insights and expertise on the topic of nutrition. Deb's presentation is entitled, Eat Better, Live Better. We all know the importance of good nutrition, but with the abundance of information, some of it changing and some of it even conflicting, healthy eating can still be challenging. Deb will help us sort through and understand the essentials of, health, of a healthy diet. Deb Logan is the executive director of the Southwest Florida Blue Zones Project. She is also a registered licensed dietitian with extensive experience in hospital-based wellness, public health prevention, nutrition, and health education. Today's format will be familiar to those of you who have attended previous Aging Well presentations, either virtually or in person years ago. There is a 45 to 60 minute presentation followed by a 35 to 45 minute Q&A period. Please feel free to put your, your questions in the Q&A feature on your screen anytime during the presentation. And as moderator, I will share the questions with Deb at the end of her presentation. There will be a very short survey at the end of the session that will greatly influence uh, future Aging Well programs. We rely on your input and appreciate your feedback. This presentation, um, like the others, have been recorded and will be archived and available at youtube.com on the church's channel, Naples UCC, under the Aging Well playlist. Thank you so much, Deb, for being with us, with us today. This topic is so essential to aging well. Thank you very much. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. <clears throat> and then I'll get started. There we go. Well, and thank you very much, Heather. And <clears throat> thank you to you and uh, your committee, uh, Dr. Nordlin. When we were talking about this presentation about a year ago, I think, um, I remember you know, thinking, well, this is great, but I don't think any of us really realized how important the topic of eating better was going to be. You know, With this pandemic in place, now more than ever, it's so critical that we think about how we treat our bodies. Uh, there's a lot of information coming out about even um, something I'm gonna mention later, which is our gut uh, microbiome and people who have fared best after getting COVID have had a better, um, better health within their gut. And how we impact our, our digestive system is really based on how we eat. So, um, it's the right time to have be having this conversation. Also, I wanted to mention back in July, I heard Dr. Musafarian, who's a cardiologist and also a professor and the department head for nutrition science at Tufts University. And it was really interesting because he talked about the fact that for many years, for many decades, actually, in the United States, we've had a slow pandemic called uh, chronic disease, and that many people, uh, in fact, most people after about age 55, have at least one chronic disease. And it's a slow pandemic because it affects quality of life and quantity of life. Chronic diseases tend to, especially if they're unmanaged. But we, it really didn't get, doesn't get a lot of attention. It gets the attention of people who maybe might be struggling with diabetes, obesity, heart disease, but it doesn't get the kind of attention that this fast pandemic, meaning COVID, got because COVID came in like a, a bull with, uh, you know, uh, very serious, um, taking people's lives, affecting the quality of life, um, people who struggle with COVID, and, and also just affecting not just our health, but our every, everyday well-being, our mental health, etc. And so what Dr. Musafarian talked about is a slow pandemic converged, converged with the fast pandemic, COVID. And that has made for a really, um, perfect storm for um, not doing as well with a pandemic as we perhaps could have. So one of the positive things about this today is that we can impact um, our overall well-being and our resiliency is what I really like to call it by how we're eating and, and some other things as well. But 
let's first, um, I'm going to take us through our slides. Um, one second. Sorry. Okay. Um, Let's first talk a little bit about why would we have this conversation about nutrition today? Well, one, um, our wealth is health. Emerson said, you know, our first, our, our first wealth is health. And I think, again, the, the pandemic has really kind of showed that to be true. No matter how wealthy we are, it didn't protect us from COVID um, or, or good health. And also, it's certainly wealth has not gotten people vaccine faster. So we know that our health is really uh, most important. My grandma, when I was growing up, the reason I'm in healthcare is when I was very young, I always heard my grandma saying, if you have your health, you have it all. And it really is true for us. And again, a big part of how we can impact our health is through our nutrition. And that kind of fits into the next one. Take care of your body. It's, you know, it, it's. Um, sorry to move my box. It's the only place you have to live. And what we put in our body affects, you know, how that living space really is. And then finally, kind of what I mentioned before, over 80% of chronic disease can be prevented by healthy eating and moving naturally. So it's just so important that we um, pay attention to our, 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 our well-being. So how, when, and what to eat. That's part of what I'm gonna talk about today. And it's kind of confusing, to be honest, even as a dietitian, um, it, there's so much information out there. Nutrition is a science. And so it's constantly, constantly being researched, just like the human body. You know, we probably know a tiny fraction of what we really need to know. And we're learning more all the time. The basic nutrition, which was what we kind of fall back on. And, and I think what you're gonna walk away with, that's what we do know, the basics. Um, these are things probably our grandparents, our great grandparents uh, told us. Many things that um, the way they lived, uh, people living on a farm, eating healthy food that came right out of the garden or right out of the pasture without the antibiotics, without the pesticides. These were really good things, whole unprocessed foods. Um, but it's a different world today. We can't necessarily uh, go back to those real basic um, uh, parts of how we eat. So we get bombarded by a multi-billion dollar industry, uh, food marketing and supplement, supplement market, marketing industry, a book industry that's selling us the latest, greatest diet or the latest, great, greatest diet plan. And so it kind of gets our head spinning like this puppy dog here kind of going, what? I'm not really sure about this. So that's why these particular topics when we met the, with the education committee were the ones that sort of rose to the top as to what would maybe be most meaningful today. And you mentioned I'm with um, Blue Zones Project. So I, I would be remiss if I don't share how nutrition fits into what we know from the original Blue Zones, places where people live the longest, healthiest in the world. Um, we, we know these nine principles that you see on this screen, they're called the power nine. And they're the commonalities of people who have lived the longest, healthiest. So, you know, we know moving naturally. And I say this because our nutrition and our gut and our body does not live in a vacuum. Our overall well-being really is impacted by multiple things. Um, in fact, many of us have known during COVID, for example, people who were very physically fit but had a difficult reaction to COVID or perhaps did not survive it. And part of that is because we know there are so many other aspects to our well-being, not just our dietary well-being. So moving naturally is, it, we know, is critical. And it doesn't have to be in a gym. We know a lot of people can't be in a gym right now. It can be out taking a walk. It can be gardening, very basic, but making sure we're moving our muscles. 90% of calories, roughly, 90% of our calories are burned in muscle. So the more muscle we we have, the better we can eat as much as, you know, more of what we want to eat and not have to skimp on the calories. Also, we know that muscle is so important for balance and, and doing things that we want to do, um, whether that's opening a jar or if it's taking a hike, but moving naturally, very important. <clears throat> Purpose, we know sense of purpose is critical for well-being. People who live on purpose can live up to seven years longer. And I mentioned this one also during COVID because 
Finding meaning and purpose during very challenging times can be a struggle. There's something that is known as, um, in the world of purpose, triggering events. Like you may, before COVID, you may have felt like you were living on purpose. You went and volunteered somewhere weekly, um, or your job was your purpose, your family was your purpose, uh, being with friends uh, contributed to your purpose, uh, making people happy maybe. And COVID comes in and changes our world upside down, like most of us have never seen before. And um, so we know that people can be struggling and struggling. And when we lose our sense of purpose, we can go into uh, a little bit of depress depression. And we know that throughout the world, and certainly in Collier County, many people are struggling right now with emotional and mental health. Uh, in fact, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, we all know, you know, this uh, five stages of grief that she came up with years and years ago, when we go through difficult times like COVID, you know, a lot of times we were in denial for a while, um, we can get angry, uh, but there's this ultimate point to get to acceptance so that we can actually process the information, get past it and move forward and not let it weigh on us so heavily. Well, there's a gentleman by the name of David Kessler who worked with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross before she passed away. And he actually proposed a sixth stage of grief called meaning, which was really essentially purpose. And <clears throat> the Kubler-Ross family thought it was so important that they've actually added it to the, to the stages of grief. If we can find silver linings, if we can find meaning in the most challenging times that occur in our life, we can better build our body's resiliency and well-being, improve our mental health, et cetera. So I, I mentioned that because we are in such a critical time um, right now. And as you, many of you maybe have known, people who were, again, seem very, very healthy on the outside, but maybe their emotional well-being, their loneliness, their isolation, uh, their sense of purpose was impacting how well they survive and thrive COVID. Downshifting, now more than ever, it's so important that if we wanna have a healthy body, that we downshift. For the last year, many of us have been glued to information on, on the news and uh, cable TV constantly running, same, similar messaging. It gets in, it, it, it basically comes into our, into our body, into our psyche when we hear messaging over and over. And unfortunately, over the last year, a lot of the messaging has been more on a negative side. And even if you don't watch the news, but you, your friends are talking about it, we have to just be careful about, can we step away from the negativity? Can we do things that we really enjoy, even under the constraints of COVID? And I'm gonna skip down to the, third, the bottom part of this pyramid before we talk about um, the, the nutrition part, but family first. So important in, in living longer better is having people in your life who, um, support your well-being. And those people do not have to be blood relatives. It's those people that right now, even if you can't see them in person, you are most likely calling or Zooming or, or somehow connecting with. But it's really important. Isolation and loneliness is a tremendous risk in our country prior to COVID even. Um, and then Right Tribe is similar to that because these are often our friends that support our well-being. Um, and you know, we all have people in our life who we know um, help and, um, if we're trying to eat healthy, for example, they're the ones we can probably count on to say, yeah, let's go to um, maybe, um, you know, pick a healthy restaurant over one that maybe is more decadent. Um, and you don't have to get rid of your decadent friends or the ones who don't like to take walks with you or whatever it may be. But it's just knowing when you need support for your well-being, your nutrition included, who are those people that you can count on to help keep you, you know, a little more on the straight and narrow? That's that's our right tribe, people who support us. Um, and then in the middle, which should really resonate um, with, with this group, is belonging. We know that people who practice faith uh, attend any sort of faith-based organization four times a month, and that can be virtually as well, tend to live four to 14 years longer. So I'm sharing this because it does tie into the three elements that are on this pyramid, which are related to food. And one of those is 80% rule. People who live longest and healthiest actually push away from the table before they're completely full. Um, yet most of the people, he, uh, most of us grew up 
uh, being told that someone's starving somewhere and we should uh, finish everything that's on our plate, right? We, we were guilted into cleaning our plates. Uh, but actually, um, we know that harahachibu, it's an Okinawan, Okinawan term that really is an intention that says, I'm going to push away before I'm completely stuffed, okay? That I'm not going to walk away from the table feeling miserable because I ate too much. And um, so 80% rule. It, by the fact that Okinawans tend to push away sooner than we do, they average about 1,800 calories a day and Americans more like 2,600 calories a day. And of course, your actual calorie intake may be totally different than that, but it's just this average of if you cut out about 20% of what's on your plate, you can possibly cut out 20% of your calories. And it's just a simple, easy thing to do. Oops, sorry. Oops. Oops, sorry about that. I lost my screen, I think. Let me go back. Okay, the next one is plant slant. Um, and this is probably the most popular nutrition topic of today. Uh, the Restaurant and Lodging Association for several years in a row now, the number one trend has been plant-based dishes. And this is for good reason. Everything we talk about today, you're gonna find that plants are pretty much the key. Getting more fruits and vegetables, getting more legumes, beans, lentils, getting whole grains in our diet, really important for overall well-being. And the people who live longest, healthiest in the world, their, their plate uh, is going to have a lot more plants on it and a lot less meat. Um, it doesn't mean you have to go vegan or vegetarian. It just means, you know, as we gut check ourselves today, and as we're talking about these things, you know, what does my plate look like? Could I afford to get more fruits and vegetables and, and, and whole grains and beans into my diet? And, and so I encourage all of us to try that. Okay, Friends at Five. If you know the Blue Zones Project, you might have actually seen this one as Wine at Five. Because in the original Blue Zones, that's actually what it's called. Um, <clears throat> because the people who live longest, healthiest in the world, not all, but many have a glass of wine with friends at dinner. Uh, one glass for women, two for men, maximum. And those glasses are small glasses, so we have to keep that in mind. But we recognize when we're working in, in communities that actually Friends at Five is probably a sounder message uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it's probably the camaraderie of the, having a meal with somebody uh, that's even mo that's most important because when we're sharing with people, you know, we're getting together, we're decreasing and fending off isolation. We're also downshifting because we're talking and sharing about our day, kind of, you know, getting that stress out of our lives. Um, in, in the wine part of it, yes, wine does have um, um, some, phyto, it has some antioxidant qualities, especially red wines uh, and has polyphenol in it. Um, but one of our concerns during COVID is that, you know, because most of us are more stressed than usual or have a little more anxiety in our lives, there are two things that people tend to, to do a little bit more under stress, and it may just depend on you. Um, but sometimes it's comfort food, uh, and, and sometimes it's consumption of alcohol. So we do want to be very careful with this one. Um, it, again, if you do enjoy, it'd be one glass for women and two for men. And um, you do want to, with anything I recommend today or, or that we talk about, you want to be having open conversations with your, your physician as well. Okay, and then when to eat, because that was one of the questions that came up. Let's talk about when to eat. Well, again, no one pattern of eating is good for everyone. So what I recommend is you kind of really listen to your body, um, treat your body like a, um, a human laboratory, like we're each our own little guinea pig of what is best for us, because we all take perhaps different medications, um, have different health conditions, have different habits. But as a rule, 
if we ate our largest meal at breakfast, ate like a king, ate a medium-sized meal at lunchtime, and ate dinner like a pauper, that's probably a fairly good rule of thumb. It's just, is that realistic for everyone? That's more of the question. Um, one of the benefits to, doing, to eating this way, we're going to talk about fasting and intermittent fasting. If we can separate the amount of time between when we last eat a meal and when we eat our breakfast, that is actually, the research is, is determining for most people, that's probably a good thing. If we can expand that amount of time between dinner and breakfast or the amount that we eat. The other issue here is that you don't want to eat a big meal. You don't want to eat a dinner like a king. And then a couple hours later, we go, you know, relax, read, watch TV, whatever it may be. And we're not burning off those calories. If we don't use calories, you know, I think we all know that they go into glycogen first, which means go into muscle storage, into storage within our muscle. They don't turn to muscle, but they go into storage in our muscle. And if we don't use that up, it goes into body fat. Once food gets to body fat, we all know it's kind of hard to get it off the body. So, you know, eating like a, a, a king at breakfast, uh, if you have that pattern, that's, that can be a very positive thing. Just be careful what breakfast looks like, because if we go out to a, a restaurant, I know restaurants, not all of us are going to restaurants right now, but a lot of times breakfast out could be our eating like a king, but it might be waffles, pancakes, pastries, um, you know, foods that are eggs and bacon and foods that are um, higher in calories and fat, or it might just be the portion size that can be too much for us. So, you know, listen to your body, balance at each of these meals is probably ide the most ideal. And what about fasting? Okay, I, I kind of promised we would, we would talk about that. There's a tremendous amount of research on fasting right now. Um, the nice thing for all of us um, really right now is you can go look up nutrition education information or nutrition studies, or you know we can look up anything today on the internet. Or if you have an Alexa in your home, you can just ask Alexa, or we can ask Siri on our smartphones. The key though, if you look for research on, let's talk nutrition, if you look for it, make sure you are going with sources like National Institute of Health, Centers for Disease Control, one of our big universities or healthcare institutions, Mayo Clinic, Tufts University, make sure the source is actually a really um, uh, qualified source of information. As I mentioned before, Nutrition, diet is a multi-billion dollar industry. So oftentimes if I were to um, go online and, and, put, and Google fasting, what's gonna come up for me is usually ads first from companies that wanna sell me something related to plans on fasting uh, or maybe supplements or something like that. So again, what I, what I caution us is when I tell you some of these areas, there's so much research being done on them and you want to probably continuously take a look at those if fasting is an interest for you. Um, but go on a good site to make sure that you are not getting misinformation. Um, so fasting, getting back to that, because there is a lot of research about it. Um, what is that research? Well, you know, the, there's research that's kind of indicating that when we give our body a break by fasting, it often will work a little more efficiently. Um, it also impacts our gut microbiome, our gut, what's in our gut and how well our gut works. And we're gonna talk about that in, in just a few minutes. But there's research that it may help lower our blood sugar, may help people with weight control, may help lower cholesterol. Uh, even research about can it help with aging, you know, slowing down the aging process, can it help people who are going through treatments with cancer, um, rheumatoid arthritis, brain function? It's very interesting. But what I can tell you is after doing a review of literature, I don't feel comfortable saying this is what you should, that you should fast. I think that if you are working with your doctor or your healthcare practitioner, they know what medications, what health conditions you're on. Um, 
they will monitor your labs pre and post fasting. That is that is the best way to go versus listen to me and tell and me tell you what what you should do about this. What I can say what I would do. And based on all the research I've looked at on fasting is I have dedicated myself to increasing that period of time from dinner to breakfast. Um, so it, if, if you can, if you take a medication at 10 o'clock at night before bed and it requires that you take food with it, then you know, rule yourself out, don't do this. Or if fasting sets up for you some kind of um, trigger, you know, we know if we have disordered eating, you know, from being on way too many diets or maybe uh, um, stress eating, if fasting triggers you to want to eat more, like, you know, how if we feel if I can't have it, I want more, then, then it's not for you either. So there are certain conditions that it, it's not a good idea. But it, if, if normally most of us fast about eight to 12 hours, that's our time between dinner and breakfast. And so if you're at eight right now and health wise, you can, sit, can consider having a nine hour spread or a 10 hour spread. That's positive. If you currently fast for 12 hours right now, you know, last meal finishes at seven, you don't eat again till seven. See if you can expand that a little bit. And you may not be able to do that all the time. If friends want to get together and have dinner and you're, you finish eating at eight o'clock at night, you know, it, it's not always going to work. Um, but it goes back to how we should eat, you know, the breakfast, lunch, and dinner idea. We used to always say, you have to have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. As a dietitian, that's how I was trained. Um, and you can't skip breakfast. Well, the fasting research is kind of suggesting that, again, if you're working with your practitioner and, and your body will allow it, there might be reason that sometimes you would skip a meal. All right. So, and I know I'm being kind of vague here. It's just, it's, it is fascinating research. Uh, one study, for example, that I read about is people going through treatment for chemo, um, for cancer and you know, people fasting before their chemo treatment sometimes fared better, had less side effects from their chemo. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. If I was in that situation, I think I would work with my doctor and see if there's any benefit to that. But um, you don't want to go for days on end without eating. I don't think, you know, that's going to be healthy for any of us at this point, although there are people out there that recommend that. Um, but I think for most people, um, you know, that that's a little bit rigid, but no matter what, if you do decide to do something like that, make sure you always, always drink water. Uh, even the most strict fasting usually has you at least consuming four to 500 calories a day. And that's usually in the, in the form of, you know, some fruits and vegetables and, you know, fiber um, so that your electrolytes stay in balance. But, you know, like I said, for me, um, and I don't have, I'm very blessed not to have any health conditions or medications. I'm still going to stay on the conservative route of just spreading out that time between dinner and, and breakfast in the morning a little bit more. Um, so if that helps give you some ideas on what might be best for you. Um, again, I, I would really recommend talking to your practitioner. Micro and macronutrients was another question that came up that that might be of interest. Um, and so this takes us all back to um, maybe eighth grade science class or maybe back in the day home ec health class. Um, but basically our micro and macronutrients are the nutrients that we need to survive, you know, to help our body thrive and survive. And you're, you know these. Uh, our macronutrients are our carbohydrates, fats, and protein. And we need all of these to survive. Um, so when you hear about diets that say carbohydrates are bad or, or fats are bad or whatever it may be, you know, that's not sound advice. Our body actually needs a variety of foods and a balance of foods. And so carbohydrates, I think we can um, all remember that these are where our whole grains come from. These are where a lot of our fruits and where our fruits and vegetables are. Um, and 
really if uh, it's our number one source of energy. It's what our body was, is going to be able to turn into energy the fastest. And as I mentioned before, when we don't consume or use up all the energy that you know we eat from a big bowl of pasta, some of that's gonna get stored in the form of energy in our, in our muscles called glycogen. And then some of it will get stored as body fat if we eat too much at one time, if we don't harahachi boo, right? If we don't push away uh, soon enough from that that meal. Um, protein. Proteins are our building blocks. See, then they build and repair muscle and they help with our skin and connective tissue, uh, our hair, our hormones, our immune system needs uh, proteins. Uh, the neurotransmitters in our brain, such as serotonin that keeps us calm, uh, depend on proteins, building blocks. And our digest digestive system depends on our proteins. So we need them as well. Now, as mentioned before, the, the benefit of plants, and we're gonna keep talking about plants and, and, and the value of eating more plants in our diet. It is possible to get all of these macronutrients through plant sources, um, even though we often think, again, because the way most of us were trained back in, in, in eighth grade science or health class, you know, that our protein comes from animal protein. You actually can get protein from legumes, uh, soybeans, different kinds of beans, uh, and, and, and we can get it from um, um, dairy and things like that. It doesn't have to be meat, chicken, or fish. It can be dairy, eggs, that sort of thing as well. And nuts, I should say. Um, and then our fats. Um, in, in my lifetime as a, a, a career as a dietitian, we've gone from bad fats, good fats, you know, what is a good, you know, what is the truth anymore? Remember our, our parents or grandparents on, on farms were eating butter. And then we heard early in my career in nutrition, I think in the eighties, we were talking about how bad butter was for everybody. And, and, and now we're kind of back to, hey, you know, we need a little bit of fat in the diet, not a lot of fat. And really probably the best rule of thumb is to have liquid fat where, wherever we can. If we can use an oil over a solid fat, it's less saturated, um, it's probably a little better. But if you like a little bit of butter on something, um, you know, it's, it's the amount that really probably makes the biggest difference. So small amounts of these things. And again, we can get uh, fats from avocados, fats from nuts. We don't have to have it from animal protein if we don't want to. Our fats are um, our stored use of energy. So they, 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 you know, when back in the day when starvation was a real issue, you know, our, the fat that we had on our body was what really protected us. Um, it also cushions our body, of course. Um, so the dietary fats play a role in helping us build that fat. Um, but unfortunately, in the United States and across the globe, um, most of us ch are challenged with a little excess of fat. So again, being careful of our fats, but being careful of all the quantity of any of these foods, because ultimately they all can be converted to fat. I should mention with the lipids, fats, and oils, the other benefit here is they give us our fat-soluble vitamins, our A, D, E, and K, that we're going to take a look at in, in just a minute. Okay, our micro, micronutrients are where all our vitamins and minerals come from. And micro, you know, meaning small versus macro was the other is where the bulk of uh, our nutrients come from, the macro. We need our micro just as much, but tiny, tiny amounts. And the truth of the matter, for most of us, if we eat a balanced diet, a variety of foods as well, we're gonna get our, our micro and mi micronutrients without it having to think too much about it. You know, sometimes there's exceptions if you're on multiple medications or you, ha you have a, a a health condition that affects the absorption of nutrients, you may need to be on a supplement. And again, that's where working with your practitioner, looking at lab values and really measuring to make sure that you need that is critical. Um, but let me show you what, the way, well, first of all, the vitamins, A, B, C, D, E, and K. Those are the vitamins that our body needs. The B vitamins and the C are what we call water soluble. They actually, if we eat, if we consume too much of something like we have a lot of orange juice, so we're getting a lot of vitamin C, we actually will eliminate or excrete the excess C. 
So we need these B and C vitamins on a regular basis. We need to eat them on, just about on a daily basis to really optimize nutrition. Vitamins A, D, E, and K are fat soluble. So when we were looking at the fats on the previous slide, they come from those foods for the most part. And they are um, vitamins that if we consume too much of these vitamins, they can build up in their system, build up in the fat cells. And that's not a good thing. Now that rarely, very rarely can happen from eating too much food. It's usually when people are supplementing with vitamins A, D, E, and K that there's more of a risk of toxicity. And yet your doctor may have you on a supplement like vitamin D is a popular supplement, um, but what they would you know, be doing is monitoring your lab work to make sure your vitamin D is going up or that it's not going up too far, right? And just where those levels are. So just because your friend's on a vitamin D supplement doesn't mean you want to be on one, right? We really want to make sure we have the right balance in the body. And then the minerals on here, you can see, you know, this goes back to chemistry 101, uh, chromium, copper, fluoride, all of these things that we learned about on that elemental chart are things that our body needs for basic um, functions uh, to make us basically survive and thrive. And I, I just have a few examples. There's so many that we could look at, but just examples of some of these key micronutrients that we need. And you know, the easiest way to learn what these, what are good sources and what these um, nutrients do is ask Alexa, go online to Mayo Clinic or one of the good resources and, and you're gonna find it right there. Um, just don't end up on an ad where they're trying to sell you something. Okay, uh, magnesium. Okay, we um, a very common uh, micronutrient. You, you can see right here. You can read the slide. You know, it helps with energy. It helps with our mood. Uh, supports our um, our muscular health. In fact, you know, uh, sometimes when you have muscle cramps, some the doctor may say, you know, take a, a magnesium supplement. If you're having trouble with sleep you know, the supplement that's over the counter in the uh, CVS Walgreens, Calm, C-A-L-M, has a lot of magnesium in it. You know, that's basically what's happening in, in that particular supplement. Um, it, this supplement or this uh, nutrient also helps with our um, hormone health and, and cardiovascular health. So it's important and we can easily get it through whole grains, leafy green vegetables, nuts, soybeans, avocado, bananas, so just a variety of food. Zinc, one that we hear a little bit about more during flu season and certainly during this pandemic uh, because it helps support our immune system, really important. And it also helps blood sugar balance, healthy skin, uh, our taste and smell. And we can get this through shellfish, beans like legumes, nuts, dairy, whole grains, poultry, red meat, uh, our sources of zinc. Folic acid, probably the place we hear about folic acid the most is in prenatal vitamins. We learned uh, during all of our lifetime um, that uh, folic acid can help prevent neural tube defects and really important. And that's why it is in a, a, a uh, prenatal vitamin. But it also helps our cardiovascular health and um, helps with sleep and, and also helps um, us uh, reduce stress or not reduce it, but support uh, the stress in our body. Um, in a positive way. And folic acid is going to be in legumes also. So in beans and lentils, leafy uh, greens, wheat, wheat bran, I should say, oranges, vitamin D, very popular. Okay. We live in the sunshine state, yet many of us probably still, as we reach a certain age, have a lower levels of vitamin D. Um, when you have your annual physical, that's something that may come up. You probably want to ask where your vitamin D level is. Um, and your doctor may or may not wanna supplement with it. But again, if they supplement, you, you're gonna to wanna to check your labs just to make sure you know, you're not getting too much vitamin D over time. Uh, but vitamin D, our body can make from sunshine. Uh, that's why we usually think that we're probably okay in the sunshine state. But as we get older, we don't always absorb it as well. And as we get older, we often are very good about putting sunscreen on which blocks the vitamin D. Uh, but it does help support our, our bone and muscle health and, and our blood sugar balance. So it's, it is important. 
So that kind of takes us, oh, and vitamin D, by the way, we can get through fatty fishes like salmon, mackerel, uh, tuna, we can get it through fortified milk, fortified cereals. So we can get it naturally as well. And then supplements, um, by talking about those last items, it really does lead us into supplements. Uh, it's a multi-million dollar, multi-billion dollar industry as well. And um, the truth of the matter is if we can get a variety of foods, enough food in our, in our diet, you know, we're not on a restricted calorie diet and we can get, on, get enough balance in our diet, most of us probably can get all we need without having to take supplements. However, again, if you have a health condition, if you um, have, you take one or more medication, it may, those things may affect your absorption of certain vitamins and minerals. So it may be recommended that you take a supplement of some sort. But if you take supplements, and I'm sorry, I'm being a broken record about this, but it's so important. You do want to talk to your practitioner about it, your, your doctor and any other health practitioners that you have um, so that they know. And uh, pharmacists are also good folks to talk to about, you know, how, how might my medication and this supplement uh, interact. Um, but because, you know, a lot of times we don't get... Um, all we need, you know, sometimes we say, you know, I, ideally I would eat perfectly healthy, but I know I don't always get there. You, you know, I personally take a multi multivitamin mineral supplement every day, like a one a day. And uh, is that harmful? No. If you don't use all that uh, is in that multivitamin mineral, uh, your body will excrete it. So your urine will turn from the ideal, which is kind of straw yellow, to deeper yellow if you're getting too much uh, vitamin minerals that you don't absorb. Okay. Phytochemicals and antioxidants. We need plants in our diet. That's kind of really what this is all about. Um, antioxidants can be found in plants. They can also be found in, in animal products. But the phytochemicals are only in plants. Phyto meaning plant, phytochemicals. So all of these, whether they're antioxidants or phytochemicals, basically help support our body. They can have cancer preventing compounds in them. They can um, help our hormonal balance in the body. They can have an antibacterial effect. They can have some negative effects too, but not usually through food, uh, natural sources of phytochemicals. It's again, if you go into supplementation, they can have more, more of a problem. They can create more of a problem. But antioxidant activity, basically the simplest way to say that is kind of anti-aging. And there's probably no real... Um, there's no golden ticket to anti-aging. And so there's no magic supplement or anything like that or magic food. But we do know as our bodies age, just like when ox oxygen hits metal over time, it rusts. Well, as our bodies age, our skin wrinkles, our, our, you know, our, our whole body changes up. I don't need to tell any of, any of us how that works because we see it every day. Um, and we do know that food can help um, help the processes in the body to slow down that oxidation project process or the aging process. Not a magic bullet, but we know that we can help support it and the phytochemicals as well. And again, if you think more plants in your diet, you're going to get the antioxidants and the phytochemicals that, that you need. Eating out. The challenge of eating out, and you know, right now again, many people aren't eating out so much. But you might be doing takeaway uh, or um, ordering in, and if it's from restaurants, you're going to be having the same challenge. Um, these are, are, are things we're familiar with: the portion sizes, right? When we go to a restaurant, they're basically serving for the the tallest man at the table, right? Because if a six foot four gentleman is in a party of four at a table that restaurant does, want, does not want him to walk away hungry. Yet I'm five foot tall. And if I'm eating the same portion of food as that gentleman is, you know, my body is not gonna fare as well. It's gonna get way too many calories, way too much, uh, turn way too much of that to, 
to fat affect my metabolism um, and and increase risk of diabetes, heart disease, etc. So I think the main thing that most of us need to keep in mind is that um, usually when we eat out, the portion sizes are going to be too large. So how can we mitigate that? Well, we can hari hachi boo, we push away uh, the eighty percent rule. We can take a doggy bag home. Uh, we can get a smaller portion size if they offer it. We can get creative in, in order to appetizers, if they're small appetizers or, or a side salad and an appetizer. Um, so there are ways we, we can do it, but I think one of the best is just to take a doggy bag home and we don't have to have guilt that we didn't finish our plate. You actually get two meals for one. Um, and the other thing I wanna keep in mind is a restaurant wants you to come back. So, um, they're going to add a little extra fat, a little extra salt, a little extra sugar to things because it makes it taste better. And maybe at home we're practicing, you know, healthier cooking, but when we eat out, you know, th that usually is, is not the case. There are exceptions. You can go places and get really healthy meals. Um, but again, the portion sizes are, are often something you still have to take a look at. Um, and the nice thing about eating out too <clears throat> is because the restaurant trend is toward adding some plant-based dishes to um, menus, you know, it's an opportunity to try a plant-based meal. Uh, in, in a, in, and because it's being made by a chef who does this every day, you might find like, oh my gosh, I never knew that that could taste so good. So it sometimes is our entree into trying things that we might not um, make at home. And um, in, in the Blue Zones world, when it's not COVID, we have these groups called Malays, but they're people that get together to support each other's well-being. And they actually go to Blue Zones restaurants together so that they can try plant-based dishes. And let me actually, before I go into this, um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, I, I promised to talk about the gut biome microbiome. Um, you might have heard of this. This is probably the hottest topic in nutrition. And when we talked last year in setting up this presentation, it really wasn't something that was on my radar as much as it is today. It is, um, there's a tremendous amount of research being done, but basically what is our gut microbiome? Our gut microbiome is all the, it's over a hundred trillion bacteria, um, viruses and fungi that live in our digestive tract. And, and we think, ooh, you know, well, I don't want them living in my gut digestive tract. Well, some of these are also on our skin and, you know, our whole body. They have these amazing functions to help support our well being, actually. Um, but we do know that in our gut, and, and, and these hundred trillion micro, microbes actually weigh two to five pounds, you know, so they're, it's not just a small, uh, amount of microbes. It's 100 trillion. Um, in fact, researchers are now kind of considering it as a new organ. Uh, it's not an organ, but like an organ because of the power that it has on the body. It helps control digestion, this microbiome, but it also helps uh, greatly with immune function and anti-inflammation, uh, things like that. So, you know, along the way in my nutrition career, um, you know, we used to think um, such and such caused heart disease, and then we thought it was something else and something else. Well, the gut microbiome is an area of research that um, they're finding that our gut, how healthy that bacteria is, because some of the bacteria is healthy, some's unhealthy, but how the balance is in the gut may be predictors of weight gain and obesity. Uh, blood sugar, uh, cholesterol, and heart disease. Um, and just recently, I read that a research study that said people who were surviving COVID better had less uh, severe side effects actually had healthier bacteria in their gut. And the tricky part about talking about the, the gut biome, microbiome, is that again, there's just a tremendous amount of research going on. And with research, keep in mind, we need long, longitudinal studies, so long-term studies to really see what's going on. And we're on the 
the, um, I won't say the cutting edge, but we're at the entrance of doing all this research. So the, when I was looking at the review of literature on this, they're saying, you know, this is very promising and this is what we're finding in, in mice studies. And this is what we're finding in primate studies. And now we're looking at humans, but we just don't have long-term impact on humans. In human studies, I think we all recognize are more challenging to do because it's very hard to isolate things in a human because of all the other factors that impact our lives. We don't live in a cage um, and we don't, um, you know, we've got emotional well being and all kinds of things impacting our overall health. But the, I think the takeaway for the gut biome, microbiome, is what we know that improves the bacteria and, and the power of that. Uh, gut to fight off illness and to um, you know, basically fight off illness and disease is plants. The type of foods that helps support our gut biome are really the plant foods. So it's this constant theme I realized today. You know, I've talked over and over about eat more plants, get a variety of plants, whole foods, whole plants versus processed. Like for example, and we've all heard this before, it's so much better to have the orange than orange juice. So much better to have the apple than apple juice because we're gonna get all kinds of nutrients and fiber in the actual whole fruit than we do in something that's, you know, gets squeezed and we lose the fiber and some of the nutrients that are in the pulp. Um, and we, you know, we also know the portions. So plant foods, but portions, they still count. Um, Perhaps you know someone who's completely plant-based. It doesn't mean their weight is totally under control or that they you know, don't have some health conditions. So it is about portions as well. And it's about careful snacking and maybe even not snacking after dinner so we can spread out that time between our final meal at dinner and in the evening and our first meal in the morning because of the research coming out about um, fasting. Um, and, and so eating healthy, that has been the theme of staying resilient today in, in, our, in our discussion. But I do wanna bring up a couple other items, practicing that power nine, that pyramid that I shared early on. Again, our gut and our body does not live in a vacuum and how we react to stress and overall well-being our, our, and um, our overall resiliency really depends on those other factors, our mental health, our physical health, as in moving naturally, um, de-stressing, et cetera. And we have created, and I'm gonna share that in a minute, ways that people can easily practice power nine activities virtually, because we know we wanna keep it safe. Um, you might've gotten your vaccine, but we all know that we still are trying to keep it safe until we have herd immunity, until we really see also what the mutations with COVID might create. Um, we know, you know, for the most part that probably getting the vaccine keeps us from getting severe COVID, but we still can get COVID again, apparently, based on the research so far. So we want to stay safe. And if staying safe for you means doing some of these indoors and at home, um, then that, that is the best thing for you. And then you want to assess, we all want to assess our well-being. Just like when you do anything with your nutrition, you want to talk to your doctor and your different practitioners first before you make those changes. Um, we also want to assess our overall well-being. So let me show you a couple of these. <clears throat> this one is um, free. Everything Blue Zones Project, I should say, everything we do is free to the community. And so this included um, these free uh, online activities. You can go to Blue Zones Project SWFL, so Southwest Florida, Blue Zones Project, SWFL.eventbrite.com. Now, I, I know Eventbrite might have just caused a little heart palpitation for some. If you've been trying to get on Eventbrite to get your vaccine, you're probably cussing out Eventbrite because it has been a very challenging process for many, so many people. It's, you know, Eventbrite is used for very many things. It's used for concert tickets. It's used for gala tickets, you know, all sorts of things. So you may might have been familiar with it before COVID came along. Um, but we also use it for helping people connect to the, these videos. Um, what happens is you go online, and I promise it's not the experience of trying to get a vaccine. You go online and you um, actually order tickets and the tickets are all free. 
And that ticket gives you the link to a video to help you move naturally, um, a video to help you um, de-stress by doing some yoga or maybe cooking, plant slant cooking or plant slant, slant smoothies. And, or it might give you the link to our purpose workshops or living longer, better presentation, which is really a lot about Blue Zones principles. <clears throat> and then you can watch that. For the most part, you can watch these anytime you want, over and over. You can share them with friends. Um, you can, if, if you can't sleep and you want to watch it at 11 o'clock at night uh, or you're an early riser, again, it makes it very, very convenient. The only exception is the purpose workshop. It is interactive. And so it'll have a time uh, that you actually log on like you did for this presentation today. It's time specific. Um, and I will say again, because we talked about in the very beginning, the importance of meaning and finding meaning when we're going through challenging times. If you've never taken, taken a purpose workshop, it will go a long way to your overall health and well-being. And keep in mind too, if, if we're struggling um, with our health right now, our mental health right now, our social health, that impacts how we eat. We don't always eat our best when we're stressed out, right? That's often where comfort food or not eating or overeating can come into play. So consider trying something like this if you don't already have opportunities. Um, and then the other thing that I highly recommend is assess your real age. This is a really neat tool. Because NCH has sponsored Blue Zones Project in the community for eight years, one of the gifts that um, is coming out of that is being able to assess your real age. You can do this from a smartphone or from your computer. And what you do is you go to BZP, stands for Blue Zones Project, but in this case, it's not written out. BZP, Southwest Florida, written out, southwestflorida.sharecare.com. So BZP, Southwest Florida, .sharecare.com. And you log in. And once you log in, it'll ask you a series of questions and you will determine based on how you answer your questions and it's all personal between you and the computer. Um, it's even questions or answers you might not really wanna share with your doctor, you know, the ones about, you know, do you get your five to seven fruits and veggies a day? Usually we kind of rank ourselves a little higher because we know we should and we don't want the lecture. Um, so you can truly be honest with, with this because it's between you and the, the computer or phone. And what it would tell you is your biological or your functional age. We know our chronological age, but based on how we're living our life. And, and so it's nutrition, fitness, emotional health, this, uh, 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 mental health, uh, several fat questions to, uh, go into this. Based on how you answer that, it'll tell you what your real age is. And so for this person, their um, function, their, sorry, their chronological age, you can see at the very top on the center of this slide, it says 68 years, three months. So that's the age the person really is. But functionally, based on how they're answering the questions, they're 72 years and nine months. So they're four years and six months older. And what that does is it's not meant to depress anybody. It's meant to motivate because after you've taken the quiz and the quiz is about 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes max. Um, if you have your lab work, by the way, it's good to have a copy of that near you because the more information you can put in about your biometrics, the more accurate your um, functional age will come out. Um, if you don't have those things, you can still take it and just skip over them, but it will really help to have them. Um, but anyway, based on how you answer it, it'll give you suggestions as to how to better support your well-being. So it'll give you nutrition ideas and opportunities to do better, little reminders. Uh, if you're not sleeping as well, which is very common right now, it gives you support and better sleep. And, uh, and the other thing that's very common right now is a little bit, if not a lot of anxiety. So it will give you some support there as well. And what's really nice about this, you can take it again in three months. You know, you can implement more plants in your diet, moving a little more naturally, doing things to de-stress. And you can, and then you can take it in three months and see how you're doing. You can take it anytime, quite frankly. You can share it with friends, family, um, anywhere. Um, and, and it's just kind of a fun motivator. Uh, another thing that you get actually when you do this is you'll get content about um, that you can choose to look at it or not, um, or you can even um, 
you know, turn that part off. But you can get content about COVID. You know, what's the latest, greatest information about COVID? Um, it'll give you content about financial tools. Um, it'll give you information about uh, relaxation and anti-anxiety. In fact, the videos and informational tools that can help uh, support. So I'm gonna wind up there. And again, thank you um, on behalf of Blue Zones Project, but also our sponsor, NCH Healthcare System, um, for your time and, and interest today, but also answer any questions that might've come up. Thank you so much, Deb. That was great. We had, um, as I can tell you, as part of the Aging Well Group, we have been looking for somebody to talk about this topic for a long time because we realized how critical and we just didn't find anyone that we thought would meet the needs of the group. And you've done such a lovely job of putting together a concise package of information because there is so much information. And as I said, there's often conflicting information as well. So thank you very, very much for that. So I have some questions. So let me go through my questions. Um, someone asked, uh, said that they had cardiac issues as, as well as kidney stone problems and they didn't finish the rest of the question but each have their own challenges, I'm sure. Are there any recommendations for those? Yeah, you know, I, and I hate to be um, a broken record about uh, plant slant but for cardiovascular and even uh, potentially for the kidney, although I would need to, um, to talk about kidney health, I'd probably want to really look at their nutrition, uh, what they are eating and see where there's any opportunity and also look at medications and, and, and other health conditions. So that's not as clear cut for me to have, you know, to share it. But for the cardiovascular, <clears throat> Uh, there's even a gentleman by the name of um, Dr. Dean Ornish, who years ago um, started looking at diet uh, as well as stress and um, physical activity and, and cardiovascular health. And he is the gentleman who wrote the book, Reversing Heart Disease. He's now had 30 plus years of research on how you can actually reverse uh, heart blockage and um, and risk of, of heart attack by consuming more plants in the diet. So he encourages his people to eat um, more towards vegetarian or at least Mediterranean diet. Um, in, in, in fact, he wrote, uh, he and someone else wrote a book called um, uh, Eat, uh, oh, I, I just lost it, but it was like, instead of steak, you're eating plants, okay? Uh, plants, not steak or something like that. Um, which isn't always easy, but if you can take steps toward it, that's, that would be a really great thing to, to start with. So it's all, we know that um, cholesterol comes from animal products. We know that animal products are more likely to have an anti or have an inflammatory effect on the body versus plants protect us from that. And again, it goes back to the gut microbiome. Plant sources create healthier bacteria in our gut. And our gut impacts how much inflammation we have in the body. So I think that, you know, I, that's what I would really focus on the most. And then balancing it out with activity. And again, making sure you're doing safe amount of physical activity for what your health condition is. And also uh, relaxation and stress management, really important as well. Thank you. So there's another one that, that uh, another question said, separate diets to follow that do not work well together. For example, many green plants that are good for heart health cause oxalate. I don't know what oxalates are and stones. Any suggestions? Yeah, yeah, you're right. It's, you know, if you have to lower your oxalates, um, then, you know, the green leafy vegetables, for example, are not a good idea. The, the, the good news is there are going to be other sources, you know, having, um, and, and I'd have to, you know, I don't practice nutrition every day these days. Um, so I'd have to look up the oxalates and just see, but um, besides the green leafy vegetables, but I would look for other sources. If it's the beans or the nuts or anything else that you can find that is oxalate free or low in oxalates, I would, um, or doesn't cause the oxalates, 
I would consume more of them. There are possibilities. Um, is, that's a case where a multivitamin may also be helpful just to help support what you cannot get through uh, food naturally. But, um, and, and, I, and I don't wanna, I guess I shouldn't say either, um, you know, a plant, a plant-based diet, a full plant-based diet, like being vegetarian, it's not for everyone. You know, there are lean sources of protein from fish, poultry, even some lean cuts of beef. So, uh, or lean dairy, like non-fat yogurts or very low-fat yogurt, or even almond milk and, and soy milk versions of those things. So I would, I would look for some of those sources. What are oxalates? Oxalates, and, and again, this is trying my, um, my, my background more than what I do now, but um, oxalates, I believe, are part of the issue with kidney health and, and causing problems with kidney stones. But, okay. you know, I apologize. I'm, I'm, that's okay. No, 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 that's okay. So um, there was a question about somebody had, a, uh, as a result of COVID, um, they had lost their sense of taste and smell. Um, for the last four months. This, the only thing that has a hint of taste is grapefruit. Any suggestions? And grapefruit's not good for everybody. <laughs> That's right, depending on what medications you're on. Um, yeah, um, it's interesting. I have not seen anything yet where loss of taste and smell because of COVID, that there's been any benefit. You know, you saw on my slide earlier that zinc uh, contributes to our taste of sense and smell. Notice that. I haven't heard, you know, it, all of this gets researched so heavily. COVID is being researched like crazy. And I have not heard anybody, any of the researchers that I've seen say, you know, consume more zinc if you want to get that back. Um, again, maybe um, if you're taking a lot of the um, things like uh, supplements right now that say immunity supplements that might have zinc and um, um, some of the other, um, I'm trying to think what's in them right now, uh, vitamin C uh, in them, beta carotene maybe, they may have some zinc, you know, you could try that, but I, I think it's just time. You know, some people, they're calling this a long haul type for some people that they, it just takes a while before they get it back. So sorry about that, um, but I, what I've heard so far is eventually most people are getting it back, but it's too new to know. We've only had COVID for a year. So that's, you know, we just really don't know how it's gonna impact everyone. Um, can you uh, comment on stool implant research being done at NCH? Stool implant research? That's what it says. Yeah, you know, I, I actually can't. I'm so sorry. I would okay. be, yeah. What is your opinion of the keto diet? Well, again, I think, um, you know, not one pattern of, of eating is, is good for everyone. Um, if you have success with a keto type diet and you're being very careful, you're working with your doctor, you're working with um, your labs, making sure that things are staying in balance, then you know, it may be an approach to help you get into better into a better metabolic space. You know, it may get um, your weight down if, you, if you're battling your weight. It may help with cardiovascular disease or blood sugar. But it's usually not a, le a way of life long term for people. Um, it's not that overall balanced uh, variety of food type diet that not only do we know through re research, but history has proven that that tended to be what was really healthy for the American or, or anybody's diet for that matter. You know, we did really well. We didn't have chronic disease, you know, diet-based, uh, diet-created chronic diseases <clears throat> when we didn't have all the processed foods and the convenience foods that we have today. So going back to whole foods and variety of foods is really best. But if the keto diet gets you some immediate results that are that help you become healthier under the guidance of a health practitioner, then you know I, I would say you know that is okay. But it's not something I necessarily say to people. Oh, I think you need to get on a keto diet. In fact, I never recommend diets in general for people because it's just um, diets are usually not a lifestyle; they're usually a temporary solution for something. Thank you. Can you share the real assessment website again? Yes, 
It's BZP Southwest Florida, spelled out Southwest Florida dot share, S H A R E C A R E, share care dot com. And I'd be happy if it's helpful to get that information to you, you know, send it um, and, and to Heather and then get it sent out. We, we could definitely do that, definitely. Okay. Um, how effective is milk, milk thistle as a supplement? I've never heard of milk thistle. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I remember when I practiced nutrition uh, more so, you know, early in my career for about 20 years, I, I counseled people on nutrition every day. And, and that was my, my focus always um, looking at the latest and greatest information. Um, so I remember that as a supplement that would come up but I honestly, I have not stayed in touch with that research, so I would be doing a disservice by, you know what, I, again, because the research, again, we know this much compared to what we could know in, in nutrition and supplements and things like that. I would go online, even if I was working with you as a dietitian today, we use the tools of online and going to Mayo Clinic and going to uh, disease, Centers for Disease disease control, et cetera, and looking at up the latest research and just seeing, um, but then also talking to the practitioner and saying, you know, or it's a pharmacist, you know, not all doctors, you know, uh, doctors are, are great allies, but sometimes they don't know nutrition depending on, you know, where they were taught or how they've stayed in touch with, you know, the science of nutrition. Um, and you can see me, I'm a dietitian and not, you know, it's not what I do every day anymore. So it's, it's a lot to keep up with. So um, you know, it might be the pharmacist that you talk to, or, or you may talk to a dietitian who's in everyday practice and, and talk to them about it. But I would do my research before I took it. Apparently it's a liver cleanser. So that's, but thank you. No, I, and I'm going to ask this only because it was asked, but you might give the same answer. And that's perfectly fine. What is the sure. mineral um, Molly, you can't even pronounce it. M O L Y B D E N U M. Molly Demon. Good for Molybdenum. Molybdenum. Yeah. Yes, yes. So that's one of those um, uh, trace, those um, micronutrients that we were talking about earlier. And um, and again, I apologize because off the top of my head, I can't tell you exactly what it's good for or what the source is. Uh, that's okay. But I would go to a reference. I have some, it's interesting because you're um, in your presentation, this idea of fruits and vegetables, and this is the concept of sugar. And I know that sugar is bad. I mean, we all know that processed sugar is bad for you, but there are, there are, there are, there's research or not research. There are opinions or there's information out there that talks about fruit, not having fruit because of the sugar. Doesn't your body need sugar? Yeah, you know, unless somebody has a real specific um, condition, that, again, that they're working with their practitioner on, or maybe a type one diabetic that's really ha getting having a di really difficult time with blood sugar control, um, you know, there might be some exceptions. Generally, fruit is good for us, you know, but it might be how much fruit. Um, you, my husband eats grapes a lot of times as a snack, but if he's not thinking about it, he's got the bag of grapes and he's popping it in his mouth and there's a lot, you know, it's gonna be a lot of sugar all at one time. So just like any snack or anything we eat, we, eat, we want it to be in small portions uh, and a variety uh, of, of whatever it might be. Um, it's much better to have the fruit, as I mentioned before, than to have the juice. And, and, and that, you know, I'm gonna segue for a second, we can go back to that, but that kind of leads me really to, to remind us all that what we drink is also calories. And sometimes people forget about that. And one of the reasons we think probably that um, more and more young people are, are overweight at a younger age is because of what they're drinking. You know, many of us didn't grow up with soda pop in our houses, you know, Coke, diet, uh, Coke, uh, Pepsi, et cetera, um, or it wasn't plentiful. But the youngest generations, not only is it readily available, but they're in 64 ounce sizes and a lot of times stop by on the way to school with a um, big gulp and drink all that sugar before even going into the classroom to start to learn. Or the other big um, <clears throat> issue are the drinks, the um, coffees. 
uh, mm-hmm. you know, coffee itself, you know, that's some, uh, one of those topics that gets researched back and forth. Good, maybe not good, good, probably okay, right? It, you know, again, everything in balance. But when we doc that, doctor that up into these, I don't even know what they are, macchino or latte type things, you know, they, they sound like desserts. Well, they really are desserts. There are a lot of calories going into our body and, um, and basically unused calories and, and calories that don't have any nutritional value at all. Unlike going back to the fruit, the fruit actually has really good nutritional balance. Well, yes, I saw um, there was a report on brain health and the, the doctor said one of the best things was fruit. And then I read this thing that says you can't have fruit because you don't have sugar. And again, it's that whole conflict yeah. thing kind of thing. It's so, but your, though, your comments would bring up two questions. One is about, you were going to talk about snacking. The slide went over. What's careful snacking? Yeah, careful snacking, I would say is, you know, if you are hungry, if you hurry hachi boo, you push away when you're 80% full, might actually want a snack between breakfast and lunch or between lunch and dinner. Um, and so if that's the case, then think ideally it would be fruits or vegetables. Uh, it would be um, maybe a small handful of nuts. Um, it might be a small cup of yogurt, but not these yogurts again that taste and, and, and sound like a dessert. Um, some of the yogurts are very high in fat and calories, but it would be a non Type yogurt. It could be a soy yogurt, a, a almond yogurt, or a, a dairy yogurt. Um, but something you know that is um, small too. I mean, the the key again is not to sit down and unconsciously have a snack. Sometimes people will read a book or watch TV while they're having a snack, and especially if you take the bag of whatever it is, say it's a bag of chips, a bag of nuts, whatever. Um, it can, next thing we know, you know, we're through that bag or through part of it, and so. I'm not saying we can never have, you know, our more decadent, decadent snacks like a piece of chocolate or a um, some potato chips or whatever it may be. We don't have to be saints, but we control the amount of it is the best thing. And if you know something's truly a trigger food for you, like remember the old Lay's commercial, you can't eat just one, well, then probably don't have those foods in the house. If you want to have chips, save it for when you're going out to lunch sometime, then you have a very you know, a small amount and you've had your fix. Um, I think the other thing with, with snacks is again, probably if you can avoid having a snack after dinner, that's probably a good idea. Um, and and um, like I said, just stay conscious while you're eating a snack. I was told once that the, the, the snack was under 200 calories, that was your goal. Um, yeah. and, and, so- and that's the, and yeah, it's amazing what you can one. eat for 200 calories, but it's also there, it does contain it, definitely. But it also brings the, the point about drinking. And I mean, I'd heard the same thing about it's better to have an orange than orange juice. Then tell us the difference about the, because there's a course on plant slant smoothie. So, and you hear about these green drinks. So there must be, what's the, what's the catch with making green drinks good for you? Yeah, you know what? Um, it is a way to have a smoothie where you put in your vegetables and your fruits is a way to get some fruits and vegetables when people say, you know what, I just don't get around to them or I don't really like them. Uh, you know, like people may not like uh, spinach but or kale, but if they put it in a smoothie, they might uh, because it, you know, you, there's a banana in there, et cetera. But I do wanna caution people that smoothies are like having a meal. They're not, you know, like um, I'm gonna have a smoothie and I'm also gonna have eggs and toast unless your smoothie is, you know, a, a very small amount, you know, maybe four ounces or less. Um, but when people make a full smoothie or they go out and they get a, you know, a eight ounce, 12 ounce type smoothie, there's a lot of calories and nutrition in those smoothies. Um, so there's value, but we don't want people to think, oh, you know, it's, um, it's, it's a good thing to have on top of what you're already eating, no. Um, the other thing about smoothies, the way at least we show them being made is, you know, the whole fruit will go into it. It's not the squeezed part of the fruit only. So you're going to get all okay. the uh, fiber, et cetera. Um, when you were talking about changing friends, wine, wine at five to friends at five, um, I wanted, I know you, we talked about this and I hadn't, it made perfect sense, but I had not appreciated Southwest Florida's um, consumption uh, as a public health issue, pu- consumption of alcohol. And I just thought it was worthwhile to make the point that it is actually an issue in this area. 
Yeah, yeah. When I worked in public health, one of our um, one of the concerns was um, we have a lot, a fair amount of binge drinking in Southwest Florida, and that's self-reported binge drinking. Uh, and and I think part of what happens in our area is most of us came down here first on vacation or to visit someone. And, um, you know, when you're on vacation, you might drink differently, might you know, go to the dock and have some pina coladas or whatever, but we do, or sunset. Um, and then we stay a little bit longer. Um, and maybe we start coming down for a month at a certain point in life. And then maybe it's six months and then it's a year. Well, when we're only staying for maybe a month, it still feels like a party. And everybody wants to celebrate because they don't see each other year round. So it's, you know, let's get together, get together for drinks, et cetera. And then the other thing that happens to us, we live here and people want to visit us and they think of it as the tropical, let's have some drinks type atmosphere. So we're kind of in a party environment. And so it, it's conducive for drinking a little bit more um, or sometimes a lot more. And, it, you know, the research even, you know, in the last year on alcohol is that, you know, is it actually even benefit, beneficial for our health? We, we thought it was. And this is where science and nutrition gets so confusing because it goes up and down and whatever research, research study you're reading. So what I say to people, if you have a healthy relationship with alcohol, you know, and, and you want to drink, you know, it's one drink for women, it's two for men. Uh, as we get older, they actually, you know, research tells us we don't metabolize it as well even. So that one drink for women really should be shrinking after we hit 65 or above. And, you know, that's just no fun if you do enjoy, you know, getting together with friends once in a while, but it is something we need to consider. Um, COVID, we do know from the data that's coming out locally from COVID that um, people are drinking even more than usual, you know, not I'm not blaming anybody, I'm not saying anybody on this call is, but it's a comfort. It's a way of handling anxiety. And um, in the month of December, I recall I was, I'm on a, a committee called Healthy Minds and um, it was early in the month. Um, there had been 12 uh, deaths, six from uh, suicide and six from um, overdose, substance abuse overdose in a two week, week period, in a 10 day period actually in Southwest Florida, I should say. And, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a problem right now. So, you know, friends of five keeps us a little safer, um, but again, if you, you know. And I just thought it was important to bring out because it makes, once you talk about it, it does make perfect sense. You know, let's face it, dining in Naples pre-COVID was a, a key social event and, and right. everybody did it. And so, but you, when you put it in that context of public health, I thought it was um, really kind of a positive reminder of, you know, yes, this this is this is an issue in this area, and it makes perfect sense. Um, yeah. We had a question about nuts, about which ones are good, which ones are not so good. Is there a difference? Um, yeah, you know, sodium hasn't been mentioned. Yeah, no, nuts are nuts are good for us. Um, it, it's the amount of nuts um, that we consume. We have to be careful on. Um, and you know, it depends what, what health condition or what vitamin or mineral you're looking for. Um, so I, you know, cause sometimes you'll read something and it's almonds, eat more almonds, eat more wal walnuts, um, walnuts, yeah. Um, eat, eat, eat um, trying to think of the other nuts in, in my mind, um, cashews, whatever it may be. And, and you know, um, I have my master's in education and, and nutrition. And um, I remember as a master's student, it, the research studies are funded by whoever a professor can get the funding from. And so if the Walnut Board is willing to give a professor at the University of North Carolina, where I went, um, it, you know, the funding to do research on such and such food study, then that's you know, where, where it's gonna come from. And you have to have disclaimers and everything, but when I'm going in as you know a dietitian or even a Susie Citizen, I may not see the little caveat at the bottom, bottom about the walnut board. So I think it's often which nuts are getting the most research. So I, again, believe a variety is a good idea. Sunflower seeds are also good. Pumpkin seeds are good. So, and, and you know, sprinkle them on your salads, sprinkle them, you know, on certain dishes. Um, and, and the same thing with, I should say, our spices. 
you know, a lot of our phytochemicals, so, you know, those natural chemicals in plants, you can get through spices. And so um, I'm not much of a cook. I'm a dietitian, but I'm not much of a cook. But, it, you know, I use um, uh, turmeric in the spice form on a lot of foods because, you know, it's anti-inflammatory. Um, is Do we get enough from the spice? Who knows? The supplement industry would say we should probably take the supplement. Um, but I figure it can't hurt. And I know there's other qualities to those spices that, you know, and it's just a matter of getting used to the flavor. I didn't grow up with turmeric in my diet or cumin or any of these things. We were pretty much salt and, and pepper. And so trying these things is, can be very helpful. I had read somewhere that cinnamon was a good antioxidant. And so I put cinnamon on my um, oatmeal every morning now, and it actually Excellent. makes the oatmeal taste better. So. That you are so right, and people who um, struggle with the, the blood sugar too—that's one that often is recommended. Cinnamon, cinnamon, and I agree, it tastes great on food. Yes, um, I thought it was interesting too. I just wanted to make it the, the comment about fasting is it was interesting because we—I often think of fasting as in days of fasting. You know, <laughs> you know, in in religious contests, you yes. fast for a long time. I thought it was really helpful to to talk about fasting as in the hours between dinner and breakfast, as opposed to days of fasting. And mm -hmm. I also thought it was interesting the, um, that, you know, that by eating earlier, which is when you can get all the deals in Naples is, is, is good for you. Even, you know, people don't like to do it because they don't like to be seniors, but um, it's <laughs> actually a positive aging well tool. I wanted to ask a question between what's the difference between fasting and cleansing? Is it just a time difference? You know, if, um... Yeah, it, it, part of it would be time um, to really cleanse the body. You, you're going to need more time than that. And often when people are cleansing, they might be given a supplement that will help cleanse the body out a, a little bit faster. Um, but yeah, in cleansing is also kind of like fasting. It can mean a lot of, you know, it can have... Um, Kind of a spectrum of what how you would define cleansing but you know i think we can all relate to the cleanse that we go through before our um colonoscopies yes. you know, right so we fast for a certain amount of time but we also have to take a you know a supplement to move that fast along um or, or move the body through the food through the body um and um and sometimes i know i did a longer term fast with my doctor you know being monitored pre and post and um, because I was looking at a fatigue issue and she thought that might help. And so I fasted for a longer period of time, always was able to drink water and like broth and some basic, you know, get, get enough sodium, get enough electrolyte. And then she also, there was a colon cleanse, it was a, some vitamins, minerals in there. So, you know, I would say if you're doing a cleanse, you want to be under the care of a practitioner. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Uh, one of our um, participants recommended more ice with your drink if you need help with of, of that kind. Um, it was wonderful. Thank you. I really appreciate the um, easy, easier kind of manageable framework to start to think about these things and to put it into context nowadays. And thank you also very much for all the questions, for, for graciously answering all our questions. Thank you to those who had questions, who came and joined us. We appreciate it. Please, if you can, take a few minutes um, to complete the survey. On behalf of the Aging Well Committee, we hope this year's program had examining, we examined the future of healthcare, we understood the aging of the eyes, and we learned to eat better in order to live better. So we hope that all of these have contributed to your aging well, and thank you again, Deb. Thank you, my pleasure.